The question is, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? For me, the principle that we work best when we work together. Well, they didn't. Very serious. The referendum. It seems to me that they're not dealing with the issues. Hello, this is Scottish Independence Podcast episode number 49, and this time the guest was Billy Kay. Billy's been a producer at the BBC for a number of years, making the Odyssey programmes, uh, various other documentaries such as The Scots Tongue. He's also the author of a number of books, including Scots, The Mother Tongue and The Scottish World. It was a great discussion, so we'll just go straight to it. And this time, for reasons that will become clear, I won't have a word with you at the end. Hi, Billy. How's it going? Uh, very good. Yourself? Uh, yeah, not too bad. Wintry blues, but other than that, fine. <laughs> um, OK, I think the first thing I'd like to ask you is that you you said you were always interested in um, Scottish literature, but when you went to university, you had to study English literature in order to develop that. Now, that's a very interesting um, concept there. So would you like to expand on that a little bit? Well, to be able to study Scottish literature, you had to do a degree called English literature. And within that, I chose as many Scottish options as I could, but there wasn't a degree in Scottish literature at that time. I actually started doing a modern languages degree, French and German, because that's what I was good at at school. But it was when I was at university, I realised that I could study my own culture and decided to go in that direction. And uh, I just had a passion and passionate interest in in the language and the literature very much came from the Burns tradition growing up in Ayrshire, so was aware of this wealth of song and poetry that people could quote and sing. Yeah, I, I, in my book, The Scots and Mother Tongue, I, I give an example of that is at a family get-together, you would literally get somebody singing a Burns song and then someone singing a Beatles song or a Four Top song, and they were both part of popular culture. So I was steeped in one aspect of Scottish tradition, but when I went to university, I suddenly realised that it wasn't just Burns, that this language that I spoke uh, and this literature that I enjoyed in Burns had a pedigree that went back centuries to the great markers of Henderson and Dunbar and John Barber's Bruce, and it made me want to, to find out more. I was also aware at high school that a lot of your history and culture wasn't taught to you. I remember a, a seminal incident where Kilmarnock Academy, you went to the local high school in Ghost and then you spent uh, the last two years at Kilmarnock Academy. There's a very good library and museum opposite the academy called the Dick Institute in Kilmarnock. I used to get in there and scour the bookshelves. And I remember distinctly coming across a book called The Scottish Insurrection of 1820. And I immediately went, what? Scottish insurrection, 1820? Never heard of it. And I opened the pages and I discovered references to my village and town of Galston. And the names of my classmates, the forebears, had taken part in planting the tree of liberty in Galston. And part of the Friends of the People revolt going back to the 1790s. In other words, it was a whole chapter of Scottish history that I knew nothing about. And yet... I would have been fascinated to learn about it because it was my people who was describing. And this to me was very unusual that something as immediate as that wasn't being taught in the school. So again, I had, I had a feeling even before I went to university that something was amiss in Scottish education and that I wanted to find out more about my culture and my history. So that although I was good at languages and uh, was quite proud of the fact that I could speak French and German, uh, when I was 15 and 16, I was determined that when I went to university and I realised that I could study Scottish literature uh, for a couple of years, that I would go in that direction. And that gave me the kind of proselytising zeal, if you like, to tell other people about what they had missed out in their education. And you, so I've been doing that through my programmes ever since, in a way. And do you think we're still missing out? I mean, there are Scottish literature courses, specific Scottish literature courses in many of the universities now, but certainly not in all of them. Do you think we're still missing out? I do. And astonishingly, although things have improved dramatically since the 1970s, when I was there, there still was an argument within the last year when the Scottish government tried has tried to introduce Scottish studies 
into the curriculum. And there were still people writing the newspapers complaining that Scottish literature was going to be taught in Scottish schools. Now, for anyone else in the universe, that is a bizarre, bizarre situation where people, natives of a country, are complaining that their children are being educated in the culture of the country. But because of Scotland's semi-colonial relationship over the past three centuries, then I'm afraid a lot of people have that, what the Catalans call the slave mentality or a brainwashed mentality or a semi-colonised mentality, where your own culture is regarded as not being as worthy to be studied and to be celebrated as the culture of someone else. You're involved in some of the groups that are trying to address the problem. So um, what, what moves are going on at the moment? Well, the, uh, I was involved in the Ministerial Working Group for Scots, along with writers like Matthew Fitt and James Robertson, people like that, Janet Paisley. And among the, ro- among the recommendations that we put forward was to have a Scots language advisor in every region, uh, educational region uh, in Scotland. And I'm pleased to say that that is going ahead, that the, you know, those posts are now being established. So every area of Scotland where Scots is, is the mother tongue will have an expert uh, who's able to advise teachers on resources and uh, how to give children confidence in their native language. And that's a major step forward. But the funding discrepancy between Scots and Gaelic, for example, is still enormous. And uh, that'll have to be addressed at some point in the future as well. OK, so to come back to the cultural imperial thing, um, what do you, where do you feel that has left us, you know, if we take that as given? You know, um, when I look at some of the things surrounding the independence referendum, I can understand, obviously I'm an independent supporter, I can understand a lot of the points coming from the yes side. Some of the things from the no side, um, although I don't agree with them usually, I can understand their point. But it's only in uh, Scotland. I can never imagine, you know, the headlines. Occasionally you see the same things like, you know, fight against the evil of independence. And it's Scottish people saying mm. fight against the evil or, or the disaster of your own independence. It, do you think these, um, this kind of, suppression's a strong word, but this kind of uh, downplaying of Scottish culture leads to this kind of situation? Or do you think there's more at play? No, I think, I think all of these are an expression of the Scottish cringe. And I believe it's something that has existed and has got stronger almost with every passing decade. Uh, I think it reached maybe its height in the 1960s and 70s and going into the 80s. I went to university at that time. And, I mean, I remember people in the English department at Edinburgh University speaking about people like Robert Burns and the, the, the tone of despise and disparagement in the voice that they would even consider contemplating talking about Robert Burns was something that stayed in my mind. And a lot of I've done series on the history of Scottish edu- higher education, a series called the Democratic Intellect. And a lot of people <clears throat> who went to university in that period went in as socialists and came out as nationalists because of what was not being taught in the universities or because of the attitude towards Scottish culture in the universities. I mean, it had reached such a degree that in a place like Edinburgh, even in the philosophy course, David Hume was mentioned en passant, and you didn't get Adam Smith, and you didn't get any of the Scottish common sense philosophers or any of the people going back into the Middle Ages. It was as if they had been extirpated from the course. And people like, this is not... Me saying this, this is people like Alexander Brodie, who's probably done more to raise consciousness about the Scottish Enlightenment and intellectual circles in the past 20 years. And it's people like Professor Cairns Craig of Aberdeen University, who says the same thing, that he he was astonished by the lack of Scottish content, even in subjects where there was a huge international Scottish contribution. And that same attitude had reached within the English department, so that People like Burns and Scott, who had been taught probably until the 1940s, who had been huge in world literature terms, certainly in the 19th century and the early 20th century, had been marginalised to a degree that they were hardly being taught at all. So a lot of the people who had that experience in the 1970s 
became nationalist and cultural nationalist and have fought to try and uh, redress that in their own work. And I'm part of that generation. But in my series on uh, Scottish nationalism, I had a whole section about what I call the cultural inferiorization of that period. And I could have, I could have done two programs on the subject because of the stories that were told to me of the insult to their culture that people were taught in their education system and in their university system. And you're seeing that in some of the hysterical anti-independence anti quotes that you get in the newspapers today. So your work with Odyssey Productions and some of the documentaries you've had out on the BBC and they've also been broadcast in and many other places around the world. Um, given what you said before about you know the reaction against Scots culture in Scots uh, schools, I, I, I'd be interested to hear, you know, have you had a different reaction from within Scotland than you've had from without uh, about about your programmes? Well, abroad, people think it's totally natural for a native of a country to promote the culture of the country. Where you have this unnatural situation is within Scotland, where some people think that by promoting the culture of your country or the history of your country, what you're doing is promoting Scottish nationalism. And I've got anecdotal evidence of Labour ministers, culture ministers in the past, saying exactly that. One overheard uh, when uh, she was asked if Scottish study should be part of the, the, the school's curriculum. And she replied, oh, no, I'm not uh, educating a generation of nationalists. And one that uh, was, I heard in a labour control district council, this was about 10, 15 years ago, where he was asked in the committee room whether Scottish study should be an integral part of the school's curriculum in the region. And he replied, oh, no, we live in a multicultural environment. Unbelievable. This is, for anyone in any other culture in the world, this is an insane way of viewing the culture. That this, this educational convener actually thought he was being civilised and cultured by making sure that the culture of the majority of the children under his uh, control was not taught in his region's school. No, that is a very unusual situation. Did no one point out to them they do English? He would just, because it was, it would be the Scottish side of literature that was being suggested, he immediately said, no, we don't want that being taught because it will encourage them to be, I suppose, independent-minded and it's regarded as a, a political threat. And that used to be the attitude towards even Scottish history. Uh, but now that's changed. Now people realise that by promoting a culture, you're not necessarily promoting a, a political cause. Although I, my own feeling is that when Scottish people know their history and know their culture, there is a natural desire to give it more status. And the natural way to give it more status is through first devolution and then definitely independence. So you've given a couple of examples of people trying to shy away from or tone down the Scottish of Scottishness of school curriculums. Um, but on the, on this podcast, we don't have bosses or advertisers, so we're allowed to say whatever the hell we like, basically. So um, were you ever asked when you were rec making programmes to the BBC to tone anything down? <laughs> hey, hey, <clears throat> good question. <laughs> well, I had to be very careful when I did the, the, the series on uh, Scottish nationalism, but that was more to do with the BBC's producer guidelines, where if you if you have the the leader of a political party on the program, you're supposed to have balance by having the leader of another political party. Bizarre things like that. But no, I think <clears throat> I've I've deliberately, where possible, for example, if I hear if I'm doing an interview and I hear that the person is a natural Scots speaker, I will positively discriminate in favour of Scots. In other words, try and get the person to speak Scots, because I think I'll actually get a better interview and it'll be richer and more vibrant if I get them to speak in their natural language. So I've never had anyone saying, people have made comments, but mainly in the press rather than, rather than from the BBC itself, have made comments that 
oh, you're laying that on thick or, or something like that. 